Well, we are uh, about to be joined by uh, one of the leading candidates for president. Um, he is the Republican candidate, the other Republican candidate that people are talking about the most since the debate. The first being, of course, Donald Trump, <laughs> uh, partly, partly because of his arrest and that mugshot. But from the debate, and remember Donald Trump wasn't there, the guy everyone was talking about was Vivek Ramaswamy. Uh, I remember before the debate. Yes, you said. He was going to emerge because he has really taken a page, I don't want to say a page out of Trump's playbook. He's using the playbook in many ways, and he cut through um, all the other candidates. All right, well, let's, uh, let's find out how he intends to continue to do that up until the election. Uh, joining us right now is GOP candidate for president Vivek Ramaswamy, welcome to TMZ Live, Vivek. Good to be on with you guys. How are you? We're good. Um, you know, I, I watched the debate. I was so interested, and it was clear that you really did kind of emerge, you know, as a different kind of candidate, which was very clear that was your intention. What I'm curious about is, I, I heard you this morning. I, when I was working out, I was watching, um, I, I was watching the news, and I heard you. You said something about. Um, uh, that you had never met a white supremacist. And that one really struck me because I just started thinking about things like Buffalo, uh, the dollar store, which just happened. Jacksonville, yeah. Just uh, Jackson, which was Jacksonville, the synagogues. And I wasn't sure what the point was. Were you suggesting they don't exist or you just got lucky? Well, I'm suggesting that there are all kinds of deranged people across the country. But what I was doing, you know how the media works. They'll take a statement and then shoehorn into it what they want to put in your mouth, as opposed to what I was saying in a long form, hour long speech, which is that I worry in this country, we are creating more anti-black and more Hispanic, anti-Hispanic racism, because I can think of no better way to do it than by taking something else away from someone on the basis of their skin color. And so I think we're, at least as of a few years ago, we were as far along as we've ever been in our national history in seeing the final burning embers of racism burn out in this country. And yet then by obsessing over our skin deep differences, by implementing group quota systems, by implementing the so-called anti-racist dogma, which is really just a new form of modern racism in a new direction, we're actually creating new racism in all directions. And I think that's a sad thing to see because right when we're getting close to the promised land that we actually create the very thing that we thought we were getting over. So if I hear you right, you're saying that we're making racism worse because we're actually calling it out when we see it. I mean, when you have someone who goes in and shoots three people and says that I'm doing this because I hate black people and has swastikas on his gun, we can't, tragic. We, hold on, we can't call that out for what it is. I mean, that we is- We better call that out. We better call that out for what it is. But I think part of what we see in this country is a deep frustration where, you know, I went just a month ago to Nashville, where there was another mass shooting of a different kind. It was a transgender shooter who had a manifesto that shot six people in a Christian school. By every evidence, a hate crime as well. Yet in that case, the manifesto has not only been not been released, it has not been described to the public. I think this grates on people. And I think we just all have to be more honest in this country that we have a mental health epidemic Part of what's driving the division in this country is not only that mental health epidemic, but being taught to divide ourselves to see us as members of different groups. And I think what we need to do more of in the United States of America is stop obsessing over our skin deep differences. But All hold, of on, us, hold on, hold on. I, 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 I just have to interrupt you for one second. That yep. it's okay to say that the I have I look different from someone else. That's fine. There are groups, right? And and the people in those groups get comfort from being with people that they can, that they relate to. That doesn't, but as long as you treat all of those groups equally, that's fine. So I there's nothing wrong with saying that I, I'm black, right? And you can say yeah. that you're Indian American and that's fine. But what we're all totally asking fine. is that everyone is treated equally. Yes, so what I take issue with, and, and so I'm a big fan of not putting words in other people's mouth because you know, I know what that feels like on the receiving end. So I don't want to do that to somebody who disagrees with me. I'll use their own words, right? Take an Ibram Kendi, who says the remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. I reject that worldview. I fundamentally disagree with it. Take an Ayanna Presley, who I quoted in that same speech, who said, we don't want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. 
we don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. I reject the idea that the content of melanin in your skin dictates what you're allowed to say or think. And I think what we still instead should talk about is the fact that there are certain attributes that unite all of us as Americans. Yes, we can each celebrate our heritage. That's a beautiful thing about this country. But our diversity is only beautiful if there's something greater that unites us across that diversity. And I'm not telling you to adopt Presley's views or Ibram Kendi's views. But what I am saying is those have been immensely influential in this country, creating a dogma that causes us to see one another on the basis of our genetically inherited attributes. And that was wrong at points in our nation's past, just as it is wrong today. And I think the right answer going forward is you want to end discrimination on the basis of race, let's stop discriminating on the basis of race, all of us. That's exactly how we move this nation forward. And that's just a different worldview than one that embraces race consciousness in our policies, which I worry, you know, many people will point to that being anti-white or anti-Asian racism. I worry that that creates anti-Black racism and anti-Hispanic racism in response. And I do think that anti-Black and anti-Hispanic racism is on the rise in this country, in part owing to vengeance coming from those same so-called anti-racist policies. So my goal is to unite this country. As I said, that's what differentiates me from other candidates in the Republican field, including Donald Trump, including others. But that is my goal. And whatever obstacle stands in the way, I'm going to call that out, too, so that we can overcome that and reunite this nation. You have become um, an influencer in Trump world. It was pretty obvious from the applause you got in the audience during the debate last week. If Donald Trump is convicted and sentenced to prison, would you, as an influencer, would you publicly urge people not to engage in violence? Because that's something people are fearing right now. Would you publicly declare, do not engage in violence? Yes. I am dead set against violence in this country because we are skating on thin ice right now. Peaceful protest and self-expression, I think that's actually really important because it's when you tell people they can't speak, that's when they scream. You tell people they can't scream, and that's when they tear things down. And so I am a vehement proponent of peaceful self-expression. I actually think that is necessary for the continued peaceful existence of a republic. I think sometimes the mistake we make is systematically suppress people to shut up, sit down, do as they're told, censor them if they say the wrong thing on the internet. That breeds content, discontent. But I will always stand on the side of peace, I am dead set against violence in this country, and it sounds like you and I share some concerns in common. What are your uh, thoughts on the actor strike? I don't have a tremendous, I'm dev devoted a tremendous amount of my mental energy to it. Um, it's not a huge issue for me. I do think it's a little bit insular in the world of in the world of Hollywood to sort of think about the struggles that actually might matter more for the country right now versus you know a bunch of people who want to be actors within an insular world of Hollywood versus the people who are you know running the studios. That's not one of my top areas of concern. It's a free country, so I, I don't reject the right of people to engage in that strike. But I do think that it is not one of the top pressing issues that you know determines the future of our nation, which is what I'm trying to be concerned with. It does affect a lot in terms of Labor. what people uh, enjoy, how entertainment is going to look. And there are lots of people that are affected by that. There's this kind of rippling effect of it um, that, that goes way beyond Hollywood. So there is some importance to it. I'm not, I'm not rejecting it. It's just not one of the top issues that I'm focused on for the country. I, I want to shut down the administrative state. I want to declare independence from China. We're dependent on our enemy for our modern way of life. I worry we have a president who's sleepwalking us into potential nuclear armed conflict with Russia. I'm the only candidate in the Republican Party who's willing to say I want to end the Ukraine war on those terms while deterring China from going after Taiwan. We have a flailing economy that needs to deliver economic growth, a crisis of national pride amongst young people in this country. Those are some of the issues that I'm focused on. And so on my list of priorities, the, you know, the Hollywood strike was not as high on the list as those questions. But, you know, look, I hope they work it out. And I hope that everybody in a, in a bargained process is able to get back to work. I do think that that's something, a lesson we could take across the American economy is getting people back to work. And Hollywood should be no exception to that. You know, we're in Los Angeles and um, we just had this crazy tropical storm. And again, I'm kind of yeah. an old dog and I've never seen anything like that in my lifetime. Maui burned up, at least Lahaina did. And the country is experiencing temperatures 
that we've never seen before, as is the world. And I heard what you said during the debate um, where you kind of brushed aside climate change. What do you think is causing all this? Yeah, so let me give you my actual views on this. It happens to be something I've studied quite carefully in the last several years. The climate change agenda is a hoax, is what I said. And what I mean by that is that the temperature-related or climate-related disaster death rate, tornadoes, hurricanes, heat wave, fires, the number of deaths over the last 100 years is down by 98%. For every 100 people that died of a climate-related disaster in 1920, that number is two people today. That fact is not disputed. The reason why is more abundant and plentiful access to fossil fuels. More people die today still, eight times as many more people die of cold temperatures rather than warm ones. The right answer to all temperature-related deaths is more abundant access to fossil fuels. The earth is covered by more green surface area coverage today than it was half a century or a century ago because carbon dioxide is plant food. So there, these are the these are hard facts, not disputed, but that you don't hear from the climate agenda. But, 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 hold on, but, but, wouldn't the the reduction in deaths be more related to technology that's allowed us yes. to to warn people and to get people out of the way of danger? And there's nothing to do with fossil fuels. Technology powered by fossil fuels. Technology powered by fossil fuels, and that's my point. So I favor adaptation. I favor climate mastery. Look at the likes of what Bjorn Lomberg to Alex Epstein to even Steve Coonan, a physicist who served in the Obama administration. I've read all their books cover to cover. I think the reality is the climate change policies are going to be more hostile to human flourishing than actual the threats posed by climate change itself. But it, but, so but 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 I, I got to stop you. you at a point at a point when it gets too hot, people can't survive, and it's getting hotter We're not and hotter it. and hotter. And There's I mean, no you, you tell that to the folks in Lahaina that you need to adapt, and they're looking at it Lahaina, saying, how do we adapt when we're running for our lives into the ocean? Well, I happen to have talked to some of the folks in Lahaina, actually. So, so as, as, as have we, as have we, by the down. way. Good, and I'm glad for that, because I think we should look after our fellow Americans before we're looking halfway around the world to places like Ukraine, where many politicians have more concern than for Maui. But here's, here's what I would tell them, and actually what is based on what they told me. You want to know what actually caused more deaths in Maui? There's somebody who is a climate agenda activist who is a left-wing appointee who believes in indigenous water rights that delayed during a critical period, half a day, the provision of water to put out those fires. That is wrong. You actually have a timber policy problem in this country where environmental activists for years have now stopped the normal process of actually regular fires that don't actually reach the scale that we've seen from Canada to Maui because they're actually planned and controlled as they have been even for much of human history. And so again, I think the policy response in the name of this new climate religion is literally causing more deaths. And the reality is, and I can call out exactly where the farce is, the climate agenda has nothing to do with the climate. Because the same people who are opposed to carbon emissions here in the United States are totally fine when those same carbon emissions get shifted to China. And the same opponents to fossil fuels and carbon emissions are also the biggest opponents to nuclear energy, the greatest form of carbon-free energy production to mankind. And so the reality is this is about global equity. This is about letting China catch up. And I think I'm the only person who's studied this issue and has is not captured by donor interests to have the liberty to actually say it. This agenda is a hoax. Our global surface temperatures going up, yes, but we need to deal with that through mastery, through technological advances that will require more, not less, use of fossil fuels. And by but what the way, if the fossil fuels are causing the climate, the, the temperature to go up? And we know that. That you <laughs> said that you, everything is based on data and results. There is actual hard data that says the use of fossil fuels has raised the temperature on the planet. That's a fact. But that, yeah, but there's no evidence that says that's going to be an existential risk to humanity. And the other thing I favor. Well, which, which I, 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 wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. How, how is there no? How is there no risk to humanity? That when is an the, existential but, risk to humanity. Is what but I don't, said. but, don't, no but don't you agree that risk. that right now, if things go the way they are, this will be the coolest summer that you will ever experience in your lifetime. In a year where still eight times as many people are gonna die of cold temperatures rather than warm ones. But that yes. doesn't mean, by, by that, the way, but that doesn't make it okay. And by the way, extreme if the cold temperature is going up every extreme year. Extreme cold is part of climate change right. as well. Right, right, it's not just so heat. Actually, this is this is what's funny about this, is, and this, is, this happens to be an area I've studied for a long time, and so this is an interesting conversation to me. In the 1970s, the same group 
was advocating for less use of fossil fuels because we were going to face a looming ice age. Now, the, some of the same people are making the argument that it has to be because of global warming. The reality is climate change is as old as man. Man-made climate change is as old as man. And so the reality and the hard fact is what I'll challenge everybody else on the other side of this issue to do is at least we should be able to find common ground on nuclear energy. And the mystery to me is how the biggest opponents to fossil fuels are also the biggest opponents to nuclear energy, which leads me to the farce, and it is a farce, that this climate agenda has to do with the climate. Listen to Greta Thunberg or other advocates. At least they're more honest. This is not just about the climate. It is about justice. Well, what does that mean? It means global equity. It means punishing the West so the rest of the world can catch up. That is what this agenda at its core is about. Nuclear energy might be too good at solving the problem because it still allows America to continue its economic growth. That's why they're against it here. While China has stage four nuclear reactors, while we're still at stage two here, PetroChina emits more carbon, buying up the projects that we force Chevron to drop in the United States of America. So yes, that agenda is a farce, but I think that the right answer, what we should measure is how do we reduce the deaths and how do we reduce the negative impacts on human health from everything, including not just climate related factors, but all factors. And I think for the foreseeable future, that is going to require more, not less use of fossil fuels and more, not less use of nuclear energy. That's what I care about, human prosperity, human flourishing in the United States of America for all Americans, from Maui to the south side of Chicago, to New York, to Iowa, to New Hampshire. Ukraine's not included in that list. That's my job as the next U.S. president, and I will stand for that accordingly. So we um, appreciate the time you've given us. Um, yeah. Last question. If oh, Donald Trump gets the nomination and he asks you to be his vice president, uh, vice presidential nominee, would you accept it? He and I share something in common. We don't do well in a number two role. There are many ways to change this country, but I will take Donald Trump as my advisor and I, even something of a real mentor in understanding the administrative state where the bodies are buried. I'll commit to taking him on as an advisor, and I think that's exactly the role it's going to be. I think that our base understands that this can't be another hotly contested 50.1 election, and I think it's becoming clearer and clearer by the day that I'm the only person that's going to be able to reach people young and old, black, white, brown, inner city to suburban to rural in a scale that's going to be required to deliver what Reagan did in 1980, a landslide election. All right. Listen, we really, really appreciate the time. Thank you.